thank you so much for inviting me and, and, and asking me to actually talk about interiors, architecture, education. Um, a few months ago, someone was making an interview and asked me about what is that that we do at the AA. And I said, well, yeah, we train architects, but we do more than that. We actually aspire those individuals who come out of the school to be more than architects. And, and how does one frame that? And it's interesting to hear Nigel say that my background is maybe not that academic when in fact probably I spent more years teaching than doing any, anything else. And yet at the same time, I, I take teaching and practicing and, and directing institutions from a very specific point of view, if you want. What I think is important for us to reflect today is to face some of these new technologies, some of these new paradigms that actually do not need of any of us to actually produce a space of collectivity in which those spaces of design, of coming together, take the form of algorithms that allow to measure, monitor and understand maybe our desires or aspirations and who knows if our ideals. How do we, as architects or designers, engage with a world that is constantly being measured, arranged, and rearranged? The horizon of architecture looks a bit blurred. This is extremely precise. <laughs> Let's try to figure out how do we do this in a way that doesn't really... Huh, much better. Um, it looks very blurred and dangerous. It is extremely dangerous. Architecture and design may be falling apart, uh, literally and metaphorically. But what I think we need to really think and reflect is about some issues and some values. And ethics is probably one of the things that I'm much more interested in than any other concept in architecture these days, as well as another one that is difficult to approach, and yet we all have in our minds these days, that is the one of climate. How do we understand issues of ethics and climate? How do we care about the world and about each other and ourselves? For me, it's one of the most important elements that we need to think, and yet we don't have the tools architecturally in terms of design to really approach them in a way that produces a collective sense of ownership, a shared aesthetic. One of the things that I asked this year, that was literally my first year to, to our students and the school community, was to practice Radical empathy. And radical empathy and architecture and design, well, uh, what do they have to do with each other? Well, I think they have to do a lot. I believe that ultimately architects are those individuals who have the responsibility and the privilege to articulate the social, the political and the economic in a collective aspiration. And I think radical empathy has a lot to do with that. How do we actually always speak on behalf of the other? And how do we do that in a way that actually is not just a space of politeness or profit or of kindness in a way that we just learn in our schools or tables at home, but we are radical at it. Radical in the 60s meant one thing. For Nigel, being radical might mean one thing. For me, today, being radical is to be radically empathic. And how do we practice that? Well, you know, architecture over the last few years has produced a very interesting landscape. And I say a few years, one could just look to the last hundred years of architecture production. We have architecture firms that actually position themselves as unique and idiosyncratic, from SOM to Bernard Chumi Architects to DSR. Liz is actually, I was having dinner with her yesterday, she's lecturing tomorrow. We think about architecture as something that has a brand, that has a name, that has an identity. And yet what I'm very interested in is in fact in this architecture office. An architecture office in which each one of those individual figures, they come together in a single logo, in a single space of action, of responsibility. So if we are all to actually look into ourselves and what the work that each one of us sitting next to each other is doing, this is the architecture of our contemporaneity. And so, looking into all the architects and looking into how architects look like and the kind of projects and ideas that are being put forward, I was really interested in looking into the world through an office that was Office Us. Of course, as many of you might know or not know, I'm someone who always tries to find an opportunity to develop a project that is interesting for me. And of course, Office Us was the US pavilion at the Venice Biennale, representing the United States. So Office Us, of course, played the game of Office US. So what this project did was to really look into architecture globally in the last 100 years to identify the good, the bad, and the ugly. 
the systems of productions and the mechanisms of production and reproduction, export, import and exchange that architecture of firms have produced over the last hundred years, specifically from the lens of the US. Anna Miliaki, Ashley Schaffer, and an entire team of people produce an archive of more than 1,000 projects that allow us to really identify and start finding themes, lineages, and ways of understanding and looking into the world that allow us to really think about flows, about capital, about issues of gender, about issues of money projects. And the way in which, obviously, we all know that this is the curve of the kind of profit that architects make in the history or in the timeline of the 20th century. How do we really start looking into our profession and the impact that we have globally in terms of culture, in terms of capital, in terms of economy? How are we recognized and in a certain way paid by society itself? And how can we really start redefining that space in which we work? That space in which we identify ourselves as architects or as designers. Those office spaces that are not just spaces of production, but are spaces of perpetuation of particular forms of thinking, of doing, and of building. If architecture, if we shape architecture and architecture shapes us, as a presidential uh, a figure once said, how are we actually shaping the spaces of work today when in fact we have a very different condition? Today you probably talked and related and spoke with more people through your phone than with the people who are in this room. And yet we are here because we all believe on the importance of meeting face to face. But so, it is true that these days we don't work with offices like this just anymore. We also work in offices like this. So this project was a research and at the same time a proposition for a radical architectural practice. We made an international call in which we actually were hiring the partners, the principals of these offices, and we hired these six, in fact, eight partners. And they ran an office that was the US Pavilion for six months. We turned the outside in and the inside out. This courtyard became the meeting space of the architectural office. And this was the first breakfast, not the last supper, uh, of this project that for six months really allowed us to investigate and to test what it means to extract and to exchange ideas and knowledge with architecture firms. More than 200 firms came to share with us what is that knowledge that each one of us carries. A knowledge that sometimes is more of the record than in the record, that is of the books than in the books. And it, is a, it was through this process of really trying to unveil many ideas and ways in which we talk about architecture that we started to think that, in fact, we need to rewrite history. Because, in fact, when we think about the great moments in the history of architecture, they don't affect 99% of the architecture that is built. And so, Interestingly enough, this architecture office that ultimately was occupying the interior space of the US Pavilion had these little folders, archives, that allowed us to reflect and think about each one of those projects in different ways. And this table that was a thickened uh, surface was at the same time a working surface, an archiving and exhibition surface, so playing this game of office, work, display, exhibition, space. This outside table, as I said before, was this meeting point. But what was interesting about this project, about trying to understand the spaces of design, is that we it took the Biennale, obviously, as the excuse, but we took the excuse to really design and redesign everything, from the uniform with the slow and steady wins the race, how architects are dressed, and to actually, obviously, take those designs and give them a twist, from, obviously, to the smell of the office. We made an archaeology of how does an architectural office smell to these days? These days it smells like 3D printers, laser cutters, and resin. 20 years ago it was more like foam and maybe some balsa wood and a, a, a particular glue. 50 years ago it was oak steel glue and blueprints. And it's incredible to realize that we constantly design spaces. There is smell, there is spaces. There is Temper temperatures, their biomes, there are so many things that we design. And so this project was, in fact, an archaeology of not only architecture, its modes of production, but also trying to unveil a very thick space of opportunities for design and thinking. Of course, what you see behind you is uh, uh, the way in which we will be reading, probably 50 years from now, you will have read that book just by looking at those images, hopefully. But what is interesting uh, uh, in, in this project is to really try to put next to each other people like John Hydock and HOK, to think that ICOM and uh, uh, probably the, uh, uh, the New York Five have the same problems and actually some of the same aspirations. The third book of this incredible research project is an office manual. 
None of us will accept that, in fact, we have a manual or that we probably have ever received one. But we all have protocols, rules and of engagement. Contracts, we never really talk about them, and yet they constitute the most essential part of what we do. As much as I know that I don't come across as someone who loves bureaucracy, I adore it. Mostly because by really knowing exactly how you know the rules, you can change the rules. And so what we did in this project was to collect manuals over the last hundred years of architecture production from different offices and start looking into ways in which we talk about mission statement. How many of you are, I'm an award-winning practice? Everyone is an award-winning practice. Tomorrow, someone is going to be judging, and the day after, a lot of people will have some awards. What is the value that we give to those things and how we want to think about them? But interestingly, about business models, of course, office hours, and many other issues like attendance or the way in which we talk about salary that we never talk about. This, for me, what was interesting is that it started to unveil and reveal the architectures of relationships and the way in which we work and operate and actually try to look how different or similar those spaces of work look like. These architectural offices, all of them different, each one of them with their logo and identity, they all look pretty much the same. So this circle actually encompasses these 1,000 projects, 200 offices, and actually where the, the logo of this firm office has that actually for six months really tried to question that form of practice and to really bring a new form of collectivity, a new form of radical agency, a new form of redefinition of what it means to be an architect today. Somehow this picture leads me to this picture, in which I am with a smaller group, in a certain way, a bit younger than this one, and a bit more radical. These are the students who graduated last year from the AA. And I, as you can see here, I'm just in the second step. I'm still just like learning how to, how to be the director in some ways. But what is incredible about this, this shift is that the spirit remains the same. Being the director of the AA is actually an incredible privilege because what one inherits is a mission to actually try to constantly redefine what architectural education is and on, on consequen in consequence what architecture actually does. So the Architectural Association, even if you might think that are these Georgian buildings that uh, we all recognize is in fact a very very complex space that every student, that every visitor, that every person who has inhabited constitutes and reconstitutes anew in very different ways and forms. But ultimately, the A is a world, and a world in and of itself that is made out of the projects and ideas of the students that over the years have managed to really somehow produce snippets of a world that radically redefines the way in which we live. Because for me, the most simple question that we ask ourselves is, how do we want to live together? For me, the AA as a pedagogical project that I just started, in a certain way, tries to produce a common and shared space of understanding. I found this image the other day from 1968 from Robin Evans, and as you can probably read, it says Putrosen terminology. And it goes from, you know, environment, design, utopia, space, revolution, solution, uh, flexibility, transparency, all those words that we constantly use. And that was 1968, we still use them. And of course, what we have is a problem of shared terms of engagement. So the first thing that I did when I arrived, I appointed Maria Giudici as the new editor of AA Files, and we actually decided to produce an entire new set of terms of engagement. From A to Z, how can we produce a vocabulary that allows us to think, reflect, and share ideas, not only as a school, but also with the community at large. And so with this first issue uh, uh, of this era, if you want, of AA Files that Maria edited, um, what we did was to really literally take these words and then open them up and invite scholars, artists, politicians, friends, enemies, um, to really help us define and redefine and somehow punctuate some of these words in ways that we actually can not yet fully understand. We might not even have tectonic translations or aesthetic regimes that allow us to understand them fully or to share them in all the ways in which architects and designers think about uh, the world, but it's a stepping stone towards space of action. And so, of course, those terms also allowed me to, at the end of the year, to start making sense of the projects that we do in the school. What we did was to actually take those terms and start identifying how each one of the students' projects related to those objects of inquiry and allow the students to put their work in relationship to some spaces around the school. For me, one of the most important things that we need to think and reflect about, and as you 
are probably guessing well. I'm starting with the A, I'm going to go through the Z. So I'm going to just go a bit faster. So what is interesting about uh, aesthetics is that probably we all believe that it is one of the things that brings us all together. Why the modern movement was so effective in actually spreading itself around the world is because it had an aesthetic project that it symbolized and it represented its aspirations, ideologically, politically, even if they were not always, in fact, performing those. So what is the aesthetic project that we do have in our contemporaneity? We don't. Why the entire environmental question that has been with us for such a long time has never really managed to take off? It's because there is not an aesthetic project attached to it. So aesthetics um, is something that at the AA we have been constantly trying to address, obviously. So design with beauty built in truth is our motto. And yet, the truth is that truth today and beauty, for me, mean very different things. The way in which we talk about aesthetics is in terms of politics, ethics, finances, empathy, and care. Here is a project from a student who graduated last year that was in those stairs with me, um, who actually talks a bit about aesthetics. Hopefully. It was fashionable to believe that historians are liars. Julius Caesar, Winston Churchill, very good writers, but total liars. Historians, with their vested interests, have no reason to tell you the truth. When the objects were released from the open prisons to the utopian cities, they were no longer manacled by their colonial past. Film. I'm going to let you feel the curiosity of a fifth year student who actually went into the different museums, look into the kind of, if you want, colonial objects that they collect and try to produce a project of digitization and repatriation to actually start to open up a political space, a historical space, a cultural space, and to start producing an entire new aesthetic regime that democratizes the access to that moment of design that historically has been accumulated. And he was placing it not in the most sublime spaces, but in the most banal corners of the cities around the world that uh, somehow we don't like to look. Those fragments and corners that we actually, as architects and designers, we rarely pay attention to. And yet, of course, obviously trying to identify what is that that one can produce. From aesthetics to border, one of the things that intellectually and pedagogically the AA is constantly trying to do is not to build borders, even if that is obviously what we do, but try to cross them. And it is this idea of transgressing that, in this case, Thomas Faulkner, one of our students uh, in his third year, he has been trying to understand how social media uh, is able to connect us you know, to this mystical space of the universe and how architecture can allow us to really feel that moment of technology, of optimization, of quantification and at the same time of emotion. And it is important that in a time in which GDP is actually ruling our lives and we believe and have the illusion that the more profit we have, actually the more happiness we are going to achieve, that we try to question that and that we are able to produce objects in this way, poetic objects, that allows us to be more political than in fact that what we could imagine. What is interesting about a project like this one is that allows us to really rethink what is that that we understand as being our collective aspiration as a society. The commons is a term that actually maybe is even not only very used but abused these days, to me is not just a noun. In fact, it's a verb. Assemble, one of the groups that actually is teaching at the AA, they actually, in a fragment and an article within uh, AA files, they talk about commoning. How do we actually really become uh, not uh, uh, just passive uh, framers and designers, but in fact activists in absolutely every single action. In an act of caring, an act of actually really looking for this other, looking to connect, looking to really understand. This is a project by Ryan Cook, and this is another video, that he actually proposed a World War E, and it's not World War Eva, but actually World War Ecology. Let's have a look, it's 30 seconds. World War E. World War E is a reflection on the role of the architect today, exploring a way of redeploying the architect's skill set to respond directly to situations of urgency and crisis. 
through a series of land change strategies targeted at designated sites within the UK, the project aims to establish more extensive, efficient and diverse habitats in the loopholes of a post-EU, post-common agricultural policy Britain. Maintaining a belief in the possibility for institutions to shape and inform collective and individual action, the project introduces a new institution, the Environmental Defence Agency, as a merger between existing environmental bodies and the logistics of the UK Ministry of Defence. Ultimately, the project is an exploration of the paradigm of a new citizen politics and state to be born out of a period of climatic war. So how a project that ultimately starts an architectural uh, school tries to understand the politics, the territory, the space of preservation, and how each one of those circles, in fact, shows a radius around a specific building that actually has a preservation legal uh, 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 document, and try to attach an environmental, landscape, urban, but also social and aesthetic project around it. What is incredible about Ryan's work is that, in fact, it was looking into the ways in which no one, apart from uh, uh, what we would call Renaissance people, would insert themselves. He's not waiting for a library or for a museum. He creates the conditions, the regimes, the institutions, the mechanisms by which his project becomes real. To the point that, in fact, it goes from fashion to surface, from politics to policy. And it is in this space of really trying to understand and to question absolutely every single thing that is given to us. Nigel asked me, can you talk about the interiors? And I'm like, how can one actually talk about the interior of the AA when, in fact, the interior of the AA is a very interesting one? It is a political one. The AA as an institution is a democratic structure. And not because it looks like the forum, but in fact because it is a democratic space in which the school community, the students, the academic and the staff, they actually vote for who is going to be their academic leader. I'm here, if you want, because that process and probably just because that process. The AA is a place where activism really takes many different forms, from sleeping in the couches to really actually publishing and putting the ideas on words. The kind of real active uh, uh, agency of the students have sometimes saved the school and at times actually almost kill it. But it is part of this spirit of actually understanding that it is the school community and it is the student body the most incredible source of change. This was when they were discussing about me maybe joining the school and here I am presenting and here I am presenting you being that thing that at some point I actually just wanted to belong to. And so part of these conversations that we have, and we just had one yesterday actually on the idea of a scale, how big or small we want to be, the school really tries to understand its direction, not only in relationship to what the schools of architecture are, but how do we as an institution really want to contribute to the world of ideas. The AA is not just an independent school, it's an association. Any of you can be a member of the AA. And I believe that if some of these things actually resonate with you, you should become one. And in a certain way, this is the kind of the spirit of, of education. Education at the AA is not just something that happens within a curriculum. In fact, it happens sometimes with cocktails in your hands. The bar is one of the most important spaces in which we really, truly sit down and engage with a conversation. This last year, we asked everyone to design a cocktail that resonated, that explained, that translated the brief of their units and their programs into something that was consumable, digestible, inspiring. And sometimes it is that act of translating that it is really genuinely effective. And so, of course, this is how then those kind of conversations look like, in which then tutors, students, professors, they sit with each other to really have just simply a drink. But of course, education at the AA takes all kind of different guises. One of the maybe best kept secrets about the AA is that it's not only that beautiful campus in the center of London in Bloomsbury, but in fact is a campus that is just two hours and a half south from London, in which we have 250 acres of land in Dorset. A forest that if you can compare it in the scale of London, is gigantic. We have more than 17 different tree species, and this is what the students go there to do. They spend weekends, they actually sometimes spend a, a one day at a week in different moments in time. And through this campus that is actually being built over time, um, students have been making experiments, sometimes with the land, sometimes with the trees, and within these buildings that actually we inherited, they are the only two buildings of Free Otto in the UK. The students really have the ability... I hate that music. Um, the students really have the ability to 
to make things. And this is not just a model or a rendering. This, in fact, started as a model, and then slowly, with the trees, with the, really the material next door, it goes from that model on the desk into a model that is a building that then becomes the space in which new models emerge. The idea that, in fact, architecture is not some, just something that one draws, but also something that one makes, that one learns by making, it is something that is very much ingrained in the culture of the AA. This relationship between nature and intelligence between robotics and analog is something that takes many different forms and shapes. The way in which Hook Park has actually been looking into trees in the same way that sometimes uh, boat makers were looking at is to really try to understand not what, in a certain way, uh, uh, can say about what does a brick want to be, but what does a tree want to be? And what is that a tree that actually could be? And this is what the students do. Then it's like, I'm going to talk to this tree. And they start designing with them and starting designing with nature. And it is something that we have been doing for a long time, and yet we seem to have lost co like, connection with that space. So really looking into the forest, into these 350 acres, and identifying ways in which, as a designer, as a student, also just simply as a world citizen, one starts really reimagining things that for us were obvious, but in fact we never saw before, as simple as a truss made out of the intersections of those trees that in fact come all perfectly together to produce a fantastic project that now is our wood chip barn, so if you come and, and, and visit us, you will be able to be underneath this fantastic space. The projects that we have done in this campus uh, sometimes are pretty unlikely, and this is one of the latest ones. This is Wake for Hall. It's going to be a library, and um, it is something that it was a part of a student competition, and the project that won, obviously, immediately got into prototyping and into fabrication, and ultimately into assembly, and now we are there in the making of a library that has started from an internal competition. And so it is that the space of testing and experimenting that allows us really, and I hope the volume is not too high, to really think and reflect about ways in which we engage with nature and, and really rethink the way in which we want to position ourselves as designers as well. Right now, what I'm trying to do with this uh, campus is to actually really, if you can lower the music of the video a bit, um, what we are trying to do with this campus is to really look into the opportunities that pedagogically we can, we can offer to the world. Right now, we have one program that is the Design and Make program, in which we have 12 students there living permanently, doing literally this. But, of course, we have this 847 other students that are in the, in the London campus going and, and moving and entering and, and circulating. But what is for me very interesting is that there is a lot more than design and make to do in there. These days we are talking about well-being, we are talking about mindfulness, we are talking about experimentation in so many other ways. And so it is in this process of now seeing the opportunity, identifying what are the forces and what are the players that actually know what is that that a place like this can do. And this is somehow what we do as our designers. We go into a site, in this case a pedagogical site, a physical site, and try to identify an opportunity and make it happen. You can find all these videos as well uh, uh, online. And so it is within this scale of like uh, uh, London, the UK, and the world that the A tries to articulate itself as a global school. And when I talk about ethics at the very beginning, it's something that for me is, is ethics is not just something that one tries to stand and then forget. Ethics actually is a form of resistance, is a form of action. And, and it is part of this um, new era of the AA, if you want, that an entire new set of laboratories are being set up. Uh, three weeks ago, we just launched the AA Residence, a laboratory that allows us to investigate a particular areas within the world that we believe are important. One of them is the AA Wood Lab. And of course, one of them uh, uh, also has to do with the Ground Lab, in which we are looking into uh, the Global South in South America with funding from the Inter-Development, Inter american in uh, Development Bank, to really try to understand how do we rethink the way in which water in the major cities in the Global South are affected. And so, Trying to find those spaces in which one can move, in which one can operate, is uh, something that I, I find pretty fascinating when suddenly you arrive to the school and you walk into the top floor, you go and visit the DRL, and you find things like these that actually I had never seen before. <laughs> and uh, you realize that at the school we deal with trees in the same balance and accuracy that we deal with uh, uh, algorithms, that we deal with computation, that we deal with robotics. And it is in this space of really trying to understand architecture, self-assembly, transformation, that 
that the AA is an incredibly diverse uh, uh, fountain of youth that in, uh, in a certain way constantly uh, pushes us and I say us as architects to think the possibilities uh, of what is that, that actually it is possible. And so one of the most, if you want, um, radical things that the AA has done over the last few years was to understand its global position. The AA is not only actually in the UK, but in fact, 10 years ago started a visiting school in which it engaged with countries all over the world. Sometimes a week, sometimes a month. This kind of visiting school within a global context allowed people five years ago, six, four years ago, three years ago, two years ago, to really explore and have a conversation with a local context, with a global understanding. And it is in this process of really trying to understand what it means to be global and local at the same time, to be able to learn and to engage with that specificity that we are actually looking into the way in which we can start connecti connecting and producing a thread in which one can start in London, but then one actually goes to Toronto, San Francisco, Buenos Aires, uh, Taipei, and over a year one is able to get through a journey as if we were in the Middle Ages but in a global uh, space and to produce an entire new form of education, the global nomadic master that we we are going to be launching pretty soon. So how do we really rethink education is something that the A has been doing constantly. And if any of you has any interest, you should actually obviously send me an email. But so, of course, the idea that the history at the AA is one that is constantly in the writing, we all know it. This is a, a group of women and men really trying to discuss gender e equality. Yeah, we haven't solved it yet, have we? And so, but in order so that history doesn't repeat itself, these days, if this is Alvin Boyarsky on an elephant, one of the previous directors, if I would show up in an elephant today in the school, I would be accused of a lot of different things from animal violence to all kinds of other frivolities. Times change. And histories change. And so how do we actually invite and find the time and the space for us to rethink them? New Canonical Histories has been a series of lectures that you can actually all have access online that has invited Francis Morris, the director of the Tate, or Leslie Loco, now the director of like, uh, Canning in, in New York, to many others to really allow us to think differently about the histories that we have inherited. And so the AA, yes, it is a school and it allows people to really study there, but we have public lectures, open seminars. This year we have Plant the Planet, Evidentiary Aesthetics with Al Wesman and, and Forensic Architecture, or The Origins of Capitalist Urban Space with Pierre Vittorio Aureli and Maria Giudici. The incredible amount of public programs is fantastic, but because these days we have the illusion that by being recorded we can watch it later, and but because I'm having a camera recording me, do you think I'm going to say you very difficult things? No, I'm just going to be very polite. What we are doing, we are starting off the record, a series of lectures that in fact are going to be off the record. Because I think we need to be more honest and we need to be able to share things that are more real. And we need to produce spaces for that. And so it is with this idea of trying to move ourselves from obsessions to positions that the school has tried to redefine itself, not only through pedagogies, public events, but also through publications that many of you have seen in your libraries or actually in the bookstores. And it is one of these mediums that for us also are an idea of home, because home is not just a building or a way in which we understand that kind of a strange building into a new form of geography, but home is a form of intelligence, it's a way of thinking and feeling. And I'm not going to actually explain many of these projects, because I think the kind of depth and length of going into each one of those can allow us to really think and rethink issues of materiality, politics, aesthetics, in ways that actually are new and radical, that allow us to really rethink how do we as architects, or as in this case landscape designers, allow to insert ourselves into the histories that we have inherited in a way that allows us to be incisive. This is a project that tries to really rethink the way in which British forestry and community building can be literally engineered from an entire new set of rules and manuals of action, in which the idea of grids are not anymore just a formal composition, but in fact a space of agency and at the same time of, uh, uh, of efficiency. And so, what I like to think, and I, I believe I have like uh, two more minutes left, is that it is by the making of drawings like this one that I, in fact are just very easily communicable objects that we can start owning our role within society. 
This is a project that is worth mentioning, just so that you have it in your mind. Eva Ibáñez, she actually looked into the peatlands and really tried to understand that, in fact, there is an entire new market for uh, the way in which CO2 and we can capitalize on it, and the way in which architecture can really start being also a business a, a, a design process. One of the projects that we want to start is a master in business and architecture. Mostly because I believe that we, as architects, have a lot of power, but we have lost it. And I'm very interested in regaining it. And so, how do we regain that power and how do we actually really go beyond those spaces that we already know, that are really familiar? Well, sometimes it goes through, as I said, laws, policies, uh, policies and codes, but sometimes it looks like this, it looks like a party. This is Taha Hadid smoking a cigarette in a something that I actually don't necessarily know what it was, this event. This idea of reality and the reality of an academic institution sometimes takes this form. I don't know what they were doing. Maybe, Nigel, you know what this image is. Um, or sometimes it takes this form of fireworks from the archive to the square in front of the school. The idea of experimentation has taken different forms, and we know that today to make pavilions is not radical anymore, and so we are actually asking ourselves, what is that next step? Because it is in this history of understanding and accumulating that one can critically reflect and make something like this, that is a critique of the students of the tutors' graduation project, be something that is not in competition with the new technologies, with the new algorithms that are coming in front of us. It is for me a real pleasure to actually deal with analog and digital, with virtual, and at the same time with other spaces that, that we actually never knew we were going to be working with. Sustainability is probably one of the most important elements. And what you have in here is a website of, that a group of students at the AA with students from other institutions created that tries to redefine the architectural curriculum of architectural schools around the globe and how do we really teach and address issues of sustainability. And so it is this space of really listening to the students to really understanding who they are that a project like Architecture in Translation, and I'm going to finish with that, came about. The school has 81 nationalities. Actually, I just met one of our alumni uh, from the Philippines. Um, we speak more than 40 languages. And so, yet, when we think about DAA, um, or when we think about architecture, we think about British school in some ways. Yet, if this is our logo, in fact, this is DAA, but this is also AA, this is also the AA, and this is also the AA. And so, how do we really understand that it is this inflection, that it is this dialogue with other cultures, with other people, that allows us to really understand the multiplicity of accents, of ideas, that the AA has as an institution, but architecture has as a culture? And it is for me essential that we really start identifying those spaces of difference to really produce an incredibly rich space that otherwise would be totally forgotten. The forces of globalization are not just, in a certain way, a, a, a virtual, they are actually physical. And for me, what is very important is that we don't throw into the garbage the richness and the wealth that we have in terms of diversity, not only in schools like the AA, but even in this room. One of the things that I, again, and I'm finishing now with, with this image uh, of aesthetics again back in the end is, you might have seen in the bottom that says finance offices or corridor these or like, well, each one of those are the rooms that you will find in the school. Aesthetics is in the room of finances. And of course, what is nice about this is that the head of finance, when he goes into his office, he actually will find in that little pink square one of those projects that is one of the first year projects that look into one of the parking lots that then allow him to think and reflect about what is that that he's doing. Of course, you can find those things in our website, but the most interesting thing is how does one find a space in a home in which every single room, every single space brings you back into this world that we have taken as our site. Expanding horizons is what I think the AA has been doing for years, 172 in fact. Expanding the horizons of the possible is that what we will continue to do. We have now opened full scholarships for students who otherwise would not have access to come and join us. And if you know of anyone who has something to give and that is brave enough to join us, I do hope that you send them to us. Thank you so much. It's like starting a new school. It's extraordinary. I want to be a student. Can I sign up? <laughs> I'm not so sure you would be admitted, but you can try. How is your portfolio? Oh, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, uh. But uh, no, you made very passionately made uh, a kind of manifesto, which is actually not just preceding what's happening in the school. It's there. It's there. It's the everyday reality of the school. Mm -hmm. um, what you brought her, if I, if you forgive my simplification, I'll probably get it wrong, but the imposing of a kind of taxonomy mm -hmm. on the school so that at any time you're always moving through the building, you're presented with thoughts that are peripherally perceived that just question mm. what your intentions are in that moment. It's a kind of, if I can interpret it, a kind of mindfulness mm. about being in the, the present with uh, a set of ethics and values that will allow you to act. Mm. And you encourage uh, an activist's viewpoint. You mentioned mm. the, the need to be, you know, there was lots of radical terminology. There wasn't much about buildings and uh, the design of buildings. Now, I don't want to sound old-fashioned because I'm definitely on your side in terms of radicalism, but I would like you to explain, perhaps for those of us that know the AA or those that don't, mm. but the AA has perhaps coasted on the success of the unit system over the last years. It produced, uh, in its own way, a kind of cellular uh, pedagogic environment in which there was a sort of family... There were, a, there were there a series of families. And what I can't measure and don't grasp is how the, organ the cellular nature of the unit as a place where teachers and students are engaged in a set of activities and challenges, etc., mm -hmm. how um, this will be uh, evolve in relation to what you've presented today. Starting from your last question, you have, you have put five things on the table. Um, the unit system is an amazing one. And uh, you will say, if it is not broken, don't fix it. But on the contrary, it's not even not, it's not broken. The projects that I've shown, uh, they are produced within the unit system. They are. And the unit system is a, is, a, is a space in which each student comes as an individual. And through a kind of a collective set of... Uh, forms of engagement, they are able to figure out who they are and how they position themselves in relationship to society and to architecture. And so what each unit provides is a set of uh, lenses, if you want, or stepping stones or frameworks or their own terms of engagement that allows the student to... There's a kind of contract, isn't it there? Is you, you sign up to a unit and the unit presumably accepts the student and the student accepts the student. So when but, they're but actually But this happens joined everywhere. Together, this happens everywhere. Well, it, but it started at the AA, but there's a form of contract always in teaching because if the students feel as though they're bullied into doing stuff they don't want to do, it ain't going to work. So there has to be some kind of yeah, yeah. Um, that's, uh, equivalent that's, mm -hmm. respect for the position of each. That has been working at the AA and it still is at play. And, and I think that that's... So the answer, and I know what is really funny, and so many of you might know this or not, people who have been at the AA constantly keep on asking about the unit system, and it's like... But, but it's a fair enough position to start, because I'm not against it evolving. In fact, I've been critical of the unit system myself. No, no, but the conversations um, about changing the unit system has been going for 25 years. Of course. And in a certain way, if we keep talking about that, we are not going to be talking about... No, but I'm talking relevant. about the present. I'm not talking but about it as a... Of course, it exists for a long time. Mm -hmm. But in terms of how you... Is it because you would like to introduce a degree of, of flux between a set of... Uh, a lexicon of, of concepts and what is it meant to keep everyone on their toes a little bit more and push them to be more experimental, more inventive, rather than to do what is required within the unit? The way, so let me then answer the three questions at once, if that's... No, if that's in any order you like. <laughs> no, but so I think it's, what I think is very important um, is to identify... My job has always been that of a midwife, right? And as a curator, even if I don't like that term that much, um, my job is to see the power and the agency that someone or something has. 
So when I see a unit that has the ability and the capacity to do certain things and to address w issues that I think are relevant within society in a particular way, I'm interested in that content, in that methodology, on those questions to be articulated and to be actually be brought and to affect issues outside of its own space. So I think the AA has historically always been an institution that in its best moments ha has managed to really produce things inside but also affect things outside. And it is part of, in a certain way, my ethos and what I actually have been asked to do is to to somehow really manage to do that. Because the, the level of work and the quality of the work that the students produce is, um, is really unparalleled in, in the best cases. And, um, and I think that that's something that it's very difficult to um, sometimes for someone who's very close to their work to speak of their work. Uh, or for someone who actually has generated that, they, that work to actually see how that work stands in relationship to other things. So my job as a director is, uh, or as a curator, if you want, of a museum of ideas and people. I don't mind what the term is, but we, no, no, but I think it's very we need important. to understand what space we're in, at yeah, least. Yeah, and so the, the, the idea of trying to make sure that we can have conversations about not what things are, because I have no interest in what things are, if it's unit one or two, or if it is Nigel or Eva. I don't care about what things are. I'm interested in what things do, right? Their agency, their ability and capacity to engage with the world in one way or in another. And that world can be your neighbor, that world can be an idea, a text, a history. And so in order to produce that space of agency and action, mm -hmm. it's very simple. No, I'm if you are you just in your space, you don't... The moment in which you display something, in which you put things differently, you allow for that distance to happen. So the way in which we have curated the entire school with the concepts, the terms, the projects, is a way to really bring the history. Like when I arrived, the school was filled with all these posters of long time gone ideas and people. What is great. And we kept some of them, but also oh, I asked... To the point of nostalgia, of living in the past even? Man, like, you know, I think, uh, you know, the great any time, like yesterday was really interesting. Someone was like, well, you know, there was someone who said that uh, should we actually try to have like different type of events for the public lectures in a way that, and it's, I literally was reading a text from Peter Cook back in the 80s that was saying the same that was being said yesterday. And in the 80s, they were saying in the 50s, no? And in the 50s, they were saying in the 30s. So I do think that as humans, we are, we are melancholic. And every single time passed was always better. And, and I, unfortunately, I'm an optimist um, in the sense that I do believe that there is always a lot more that we can do in the future than in the past, but I'm very interested in, in articulating that transition and finding the real no, values but if of you, that. If, oh, you know, some, of the, some of the most difficult moments for students have been when there have been strong figures and strong work in the school, mm. and the students that come in the following years find it extremely hard to actually live up to what has gone before, you know, it happened with Zaha, for mm -hmm. example, that the, the effect of Zaha in the school was so strong that many how other students... I mean, I wasn't there. How many, was it? Well, many, other, many students, other students, felt uh, um, uh, incapable of rising to and actually competing at that level. Or year, I mean, in, in, in sequentially, mm -hmm. when there'd been a particularly successful year, the following year, the students were slightly lost because they had to outdo the ones from the year before. Mm. I guess that happens probably in every school, but um, I mean, we have a really healthy um, amount of students. We are small, but still we are big enough. And, but and your, I your, you know, some schools have difficulty uh, encouraging students to take risk. It strikes me that you are making it permissible, if not required, to take risks, because if you don't take risks, you're going to be dead on your feet. <laughs> I didn't sign up to run uh, a, a school that didn't have written in its uh, uh, DNA that we do take risks in absolutely every single act, as much as uh, it is intellectually uh, uh, viable and possible in the era in which we live. And I think it is, it is our mandate to, to push and to really, it really help us as a society and, and uh, to really identify the next frontiers. 
and to be able to actually help others identify the direction. So in a certain way, to take a risk is just to simply show the way. <laughs> well, and, and that's of, a different thing. One of you the can frame constant it that way. recurrent risks in architectural education is that there, if, there, if there is work, some of which, like some of which we've seen, which is sensitive to climate and landscape and borderless spaces mm -hmm. and uh, let's say, an ethereal notion of space mm -hmm. rather than a conventional, enclosed, solid one that is kind of defined by most architecture. At some point, it puts you, puts, uh, uh, it sets up a collision course with those professional bodies that uh, decide whether architectural education is okay or not. It's, oh, that's oh, also in, uh, your, your building question. It's, it's let me. Let, so I, I did well, run. I know it's a boring question, no, it's but not it's boring. a kind of an interesting one. Can I, can I ask you a question? Of course. So I, I'll, I'll ask more questions than you. But anyway, that's fine. So <laughs> when I say two percent, four percent, twelve percent, what do you think about? Uh, I think in terms of a picture, because hmm. I turn things into pictures. So last year, when I was in my first day in the school, I asked the first year students the same question. And I gave them three minutes to think about it. A um, really long time. And, um, and I said, look, 2% is the, maximum, the minimum slope that a roof in a Mediterranean climate needs to have in order, in order to evacuate water in, uh, uh, in material terms. 4% is the maximum slope that, uh, uh, that one can have for a handicap to actually have full accessibility. And 12% is the maximum slope uh, that a ramp will have in, in the European context, but after 10 meters, you need to have a one meter horizontal landing step. And that kind of knowledge, right, that is essential to an architect if we are to design from public space to interior spaces, is something that uh, for me is essential. I come from training from the Polytechnic in which the day we graduate, we are licensed architects. So I believe in the power of architecture and buildings as much as, as much as you might No, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily uh, uh, interpret that as, a, as numbers. No. Because in, it's also the requirement of an architect to be able to sense whether a slope is navigable or not, to be able to draw it in a way which makes a kind of architectonic composition For in sure. a drawing. No doubt the numbers about that. don't matter. They, you can always look them up. You can always look them up, but if, unless you really do have a, an understanding of what is that that is possible, you can always look it up. But it is in a certain way, I can also look up all the words in the vocabulary. I better learn English if I want to communicate with you in a faster, more efficient way, right? So the, the question here is to understand what are the valuable elements. When I started showing you those algorithms, right? Mm -hmm. And if you look into the architecture that is produced around the world, 99% of it is done without architects. 99% of it is actually done without... And much of it is better than what architects do. And so I think we really do need... And so one of the issues, if you want, with um, the professionalization and the, and the uh, accrediting bodies coming from the US is that um, there are people who actually graduate who have absolutely no clue. In the US, you have absolutely... Uh, uh, I mean, I, I, people who actually would not know how to draw a plan, right? And I was fascinated. And I was like, hmm. And then they would take like three years of practice with someone else, and then they actually would pass 10 exams with uh, the AIA and, and, and CARP and so on. And, you know, I, I studied five really? years, and I graduated, and I became an architect. And, and it's not I became an architect. I know a lot of things that actually make you according to the legal and regulatory frameworks. I'm still paying the insurance liability of the last building I made 10 years ago, yeah? And so what is really funny is that, for me, what is very important is that education is something that teaches you to learn and gives you, and the difficult thing is to know what to teach and how to teach it. And the rest is for you to take, because you're going to be learning. I learn absolutely every single day. And I think that that is the gift that a real education can give you. But the difficult question is to identify that minimum common denominator that actually constitutes architecture education and how we value that, how we validate that, and how do we make it contemporary in relationship to the issues and the urgencies that are around us? That's really one of the most important well, the, and fundamental questions. The business questions. of climate and, and sustainability mm -hmm. is inevitably going to change our, our sense of environment. 
And you know, the, 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 even the word architecture is, has never been more up for grabs than it is now. Because it doesn't just mean four walls and a roof stuck on it. Uh, and it can't mean that. But at the same time, it's important to, eat, uh, to draw out that conversation mm -hmm. so that everyone understands. You talked about terms of engagement. It mm -hmm. seems to me that people, uh, they sort of need to understand to what degree they need to produce something that is a recognizable architectural artifact. To the level in which that actually is going to have an effect and an agency in the society in which we live. Impact. But it could Impact be that that agency one... is to actually undo the architectural profession, which perhaps needs to be completely reassessed. I, I'm, as I said before, I don't undo things. I do. I might do, you I have do to things. dismantle before you recreate. But anyway. Uh, that's the, construct, the constructivist era. I come from a different one. Well, I, I was thinking that. There. I wrote that <laughs> down. I wrote down Bauhaus, uh, starting from scratch. <laughs> you, no, a sort of is, Weimar is, spirit in what you're there doing. Is, there is no scratch. There is an incredible history that we have a lot to learn from. And I think um, what I started this talk, you know, talking about this corporate and avant-garde and this kind of false dichotomies that we have put for ourselves, profession versus uh, a critical, historian versus projective. We need to abandon all these uh, self-proclaimed positions and work together to really, really, truly understand how do we as architects, designers, lawyers, poets, really make architecture possible. Well, I'm... Am I... Let me, let me rudely interrupt and say that's a lovely uh, note to end on. I was um, just about to wrap up, up, up Paul. Because Sorry. This, con this conversation, I can tell, will run and run <laughs> uh, because uh, this is the voices of Bedford Square <laughs> across the generations and long may the debate last. Eva, Nigel, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.